growth and widespread economic decline. But just to make sure that it's that it's real, they look at other things, whoops, other things to back it up. <coughs> the, the National Bureau of Economic Research, this is in the United States, but, but most other countries use a similar sort of prototype. They look at the person income and is unemployment rising, is personal income falling or rising at a much lower rate? This kind of confirms if it's a recession or not. So this is sort of secondary information. So they'll look at that and say, well, ah, okay, that really is a recession. If there's rising unemployment, declining real income. <coughs> okay. Now, now, in the reality of the world, instead of the free market economy, we begin to see these really dramatic overshoots where we go far beyond the trend. If the uh, long-term trend of economic growth was something like this, and all of a sudden it looks more like this, this is extraordinary. Now, what we long learned to describe these conditions are artificial booms or bubbles. Now, a bubble is simply a condition where asset prices are wildly overvalued. <coughs> so you have exaggeration, unsustainable levels of asset pricing or commodity pricing. Like there was a, uh, a bubble in the price of, of oil a couple of years ago when the price of oil went to $147 a barrel and was going to go up forever, at least to $200 a barrel, and then, whoops, the bubble burst and it went down to, I think, as low as $30 a barrel before it started coming back up again. That was the growth was to $47. i am sorry? $47 was the first ah, growth. Yeah, okay. So, so you have commodity bubbles, you have asset bubbles, so these are overstated values. So we have the dot-com bubble in the United States in, in terms of uh, technology stocks into the 1990s. Uh, we just had, and I think you had here also a uh, property bubble. Now, these are related to recession. Now, the end of these bubbles usually uh, signals the beginning of a recession. So it's important to understand what's going on. Now, mainstream economists In other words, the 95% of the economists that will oppose or misunderstand what I'm going to say have their own understanding of bubbles. So they give the general public and policymakers a way of, of reacting to bubbles. Now, how do they explain it? How do these other economists explain it? So the Keynesian, the neoclassical economists, if you go to a basic economics textbook, well, you start with Keynes. Keynes said, animal spirits. Investors just act like they act in a herd. They just follow each other around. They're, 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 you know, if one does it, they all imitate. Now, I mean, we, we look around in this room. Now, do we behave as a herd? Some of you came early, some of you came late, <coughs> some of you came later. Hey, where's the hurting behavior in the natural instincts of human beings? Are you all dressed alike? You saw each other at breakfast, you could have... Hurting is not a human characteristic. But somehow, the idea that animal spirits is what drives investors to do certain things passes what I call the smell test. You know, like, phew. instead they go, oh, this smells okay. And I'm, yeah, that's, well, that makes sense. No, it doesn't make sense. It's not an explanation. It's, it's an economist who doesn't understand economics trying to use psychology, which they also probably don't understand, to explain something that they don't, that they can't explain. And this is what Keynes did. Keynes really was not, in my view, a very good economist. I mean, he provides his own evidence of that. Uh, and this is more of This is to me the primary indicator that Keynes didn't understand economics, so he tried to use psychology, animal spirits. 
It's not an explanation. It's just a, it's just a, a reference. And it's contradicted by human behavior. Herding is not a natural instinct of human beings. And as I said, bulls and bears, I mean, bull, the presence of bulls and bears on the opposite sides of every transaction show us, I mean, according to animal instincts, there would be no market transactions. Everybody would always be sellers, or everybody would always be buyers. And everybody knows that the investors are very individualistic. They keep secret yeah. about yeah. any information. Yeah. Yeah. This. We, but, but, having said that, then we have to explain why they begin to do certain things that look like her behavior. It's not her behavior. Because like you say, normally they're trying to, you know, they, they, they don't want you to know what they're investing in or why. Because they know that that is, is, is valuable information. I mean, Warren Buffett, if he told everybody, oh, tomorrow I'm going to buy General Motors stock. What would happen to General Motors stock before he bought it? Whoops. Oh, he wouldn't make a profit. So, it's like you said, investors are pretending to be very secretive. Now, so, bubbles are inherent from un inherently unstable markets, especially capital markets. This is what Keynes said. And of course, Keynes' solution, as we'll see later, government can fix it. These crazy investors, you can't trust them. They're going to do all kinds of stupid things, but give it to some intelligent, and this is the problem with Keynes in a way. He was so deeply intelligent that he believed that he would make the right decision. <coughs> but he didn't understand that other people are not as deeply intelligent as he is. That would be making those decisions when he dies or whatever. Or in other countries. So this is an interesting thing about these really intelligent people. They, 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 they lack the humility. Uh, that, in fact, they might not be intelligent enough to do what they claim to do, but at the same time, they, they lack the intelligence to understand that other people who might succeed them won't. Now, now, another argument was, it's neoliberalism that caused these problems. The bubble, for example, in the United States property market, was all about deregulating the financial market. That it's as though, all of a sudden, all the world's policymakers were hypnotized by Milton Friedman or someone, and they all became neoliberals, and there wasn't enough regulation in financial markets. And this is what caused the problem. But wait a minute. The financial sector of the United States is the most regulated sector of the entire economy. There are tens of thousands of regulators spending billions of dollars of taxpayers' money to regulate the financial sector. To argue that, that they are insufficiently regulated defies reality. But again, somehow, people accept this argument despite the, despite the evidence, the contrary evidence. <coughs> there were some changes in some regulations of the United States financial sector. But overall, the amount of overall regulation went up over the last 10 or 15 years, and it's now going to go up even more. So this, as we'll see, this is nonsense. Another argument was poor corporate governance. That is, the overpaid bankers misbehaved. They were greedy. But again, does this pass the smell test? Were, were bankers greedy 20 years ago? Yes. They're always greedy. They always, like you and me, they want to make more. They always were. Why is it all of a sudden that they're more greedy or they're more successful in being greedy? There's got to be something more fundamental behind it. This is an insufficient argument. It's as though, wait, the bankers that, that were born in a certain year were the only greedy bankers. No, it doesn't, doesn't pass the smell test. There's got to be something more fundamental. And, well, and the other thing in the United States, it was the homeowners. They lied to get the mortgages. They, they didn't have enough income to pay them off. But why did they get the mortgages? Where did the money come from? Well, you 
came from the bankers. The greedy bankers, right? What? Wait, where did the bankers get the money? From the Federal Reserve, the central bank. The fundamental problem, these are, these are, these are ways of saying, trying to understand something that looks like it's happening around the event you want to describe. The fundamental cause of all of these problems was too much liquidity in the U.S. financial markets. So that the greedy bankers, all of a sudden, their pockets were being stuffed with money that was being pumped into the system by the central bank. They got these, these uh, deposits. They've got to earn money on them. How do you earn money as a banker? You make loans to people. So I've got to get these, this, there's so much money in the system, I've got to get it out as fast as I can, or I lose money. Now, I begin to lower my standards and loan it to everybody that comes in, but I wouldn't have done that if there wasn't too much money in the system. So the bankers were in a way, they were always greedy, but this time they were exploited or they were victimized, sorry, they were victimized by the central bank. The central bank was pumping too much money in the system. The same for the homeowners. They said, gosh, interest rates will never be so low again. I, I'll never be able to afford a home ever in my life. If these interest rates. So they, they were victimized. They weren't any more greedy or more dishonest than before. Circumstances allowed them to make the wrong decisions. If you take away the liquidity created by the central bank, none of that would have happened. Asset prices could never have gotten so high. Loans would not have been made at such a rapid rate and in such ridiculous conditions. Banks couldn't have been successful being greedy. And you know why all those financial derivatives that nobody understands, those collateralized debt uh, instruments? Bankers, in a way, I put it in this. You know what crack cocaine is? Yeah. Crack cocaine was invented by drug dealers who were looking for increased profits of, a, of, 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 of the product they were selling. They were trying to expand markets. <laughs> So in a way, these financial derivatives are like crack. Because what happened is that the, the, the bankers all of a sudden they had to find a way to market all of these, all this liquidity that was going into the banking system. So they created these collateralized debt instruments, these financial derivatives. And they wouldn't have invented them if all that money hadn't been pumped into the system. They were sort of forced into inventing something new in order to expand the market for their, in, in order to make profits. So, so the summary of all of this, conventional economists, I mean books are written about it, movies are being made about it. <coughs> Capitalism failed. And we are here to help you. <laughs> the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, you know, politics. so all of you are sitting there, citizens say, help us. You told us you're there to help us. Politicians, do something. Don't just sit there. Do anything. Thank you. Okay? I help you. Give me more taxes. Give me more freedom. You have to give up, give me more power. And I will help you. And this is what we see all the time. Governments benefit from crises. Because they frighten you into giving up uh, more of your freedoms and more of your resources. So governments grow. They get more power. The IMF has more resources. You know, I used to tell my students, and, and I, I suppose if I was fair about it, so if, you, if you want to make your life better off, and you don't care about making other people's lives worse off, go and work for the IMF or the World Bank. Because these guys make very large salaries, tax-free. But they do enormous <coughs> damage to the world, I believe. In the sense that their policies encourage governments to do the wrong thing. The 
What mean? It's like the Al Qaeda. It's a yeah. 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 I mean, these are the yeah. These guys are financial terrorists. Not the not mm -hmm. the. Now, the, so the mainstream economists, the, the ninety five percent that will disagree with me, uh, they come up with public policy responses, and their responses are more government intervention to correct the problems of unstable markets. Surprise! What do politicians want? I mean, even honest politicians who are patriotic, who love their country, who love their people, do they want more power or less power? More. More power. <coughs> you have to have more power to do good for your people because you are, you care about your people. Do you, do you want more resources or less resources? More or more. Okay, now, this is, now, not all politicians are not corrupt, not some are unpatriotic, they only care about themselves or their families. So it's dangerous when you were giving every politician more power and more resources. So, somebody said something to so, ah, Okay. Yeah. Now, so here we are. We're giving them. So how do we do it? Deficit spending. <coughs> Why? Because there's not enough aggregate demand. This plays into the hands of the Keynesians, follows Keynesian analysis to a perfect uh, Lock set. I mean, it's a perfect rhythm with the understanding that the macro economists tell them. The, the problem with the economy is aggregate demand. It's too low. We need to make it higher. <coughs> uh, problem deflating asset prices. Asset prices are collapsing. We can't let that happen. Don't let them fall. Push them up. We need to regulate the financial sector because these greedy Bankers are being paid too much. There was a G20 meeting in 2009 or 10 in Pittsburgh. President Obama came out and they said, We discovered the problem. Bankers get big bonuses. <laughs> this was a serious payment. That was what they agreed. <coughs> they didn't say, I wonder if it's government policy. Or central bank. No, they didn't explore that. Because I would say, uh, imagine they would come out and say, it was our fault. No! Politics is about accepting praise and shifting blame. I do good things for you, he does bad things. He's, a, he's an overpaid, bonus seeking banker. Right? This is, what, this is how you win in politics. How you get things done. You accept praise and shift blame. So, now, aggressive loosening of, of monetary policy. In other words, drive interest rates as low as possible. Of course, you do that by the central bank, either quantitative easing or printing money or any number of different policy tools. Now, let's Bring in an imaginary 10-year-old child here who's never studied economics, probably. Say, so I'm going to describe to you a situation and then explain to you how to solve it. Okay, okay. 10 years, a smart kid, okay? Say, so, okay, now, we had a, 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 a problem. You know what the problem is. And it was an economic problem. Okay, no, I don't know economics, but okay, it's a problem. I say, now, this problem was caused by too much borrowing. Now, in other words, we know what we're saying. The consumers are borrowing too much. Okay? Now, this caused the problem. Now, you say, okay, now, we're going to solve that problem by making the government spend more. The 10-year-old child will go, well, wait a minute, how can, if the problem was too much spending, how can more spending be a solution? So the 10-year-old child will say, it doesn't pass the smell test. A 10-year-old child! Just on the logic, not the economics. Just on the logic. And he said, okay. Now, we had this problem, and it was because interest rates were very low. Okay. I don't know what interest <coughs> rates are, but I know what you're saying. Is, you know. And he said, okay, we're going to fix this problem by making interest rates even lower. The Jenny Orchard said, no. That, that can't be a solution. He said, well, I'll. Well, you know, the, the problem was before we had 
a number, a big number of big banks that were too big to fail. And we had to protect them. Okay? He said, and then the 10 year old child said, well, What do you have now? We say, Well, now we've got a smaller number of much bigger banks as an outcome of our policy. Do you think we did the right thing? He said, It doesn't sound good to me. A 10 year old child would understand. <coughs> But if you've got a PhD in economics and you have won a Nobel Prize, you can stand up and say this and people will applaud you. And also. Yeah. And especially though. This is breathtaking. So, let's look at this boom and bust cycle. Austrian economists understand all of this differently. Now, this is where we're on dangerous grounds. Beware. If you enter in you are going to be in a tiny minority of people who understand economics this way. Now, instead of a symptomatic interpretation of recessions, like remember the National Bureau of Economic Research? We look at a causal definition. We want to see what causes a recession. So, again, the National Bureau of Economic Research just says, well, something happens, and there it is. But we want to know why it is. Now, okay. What we see is that a period of unsustainable growth. Now, I'll have to explain what that means. In other words, the overshooting of the trend line. The trend line was here, and all of a sudden we're finding our economy on a much higher growth path. It is unsustainable. And everybody knows it's going to end sooner or later, but, you know, during the dot-com bubble, I and a number of my friends kept saying, it, it, it's not going to last. So I'm going to short the market now because the market's way overbound. And of course, it kept going, and I lost money. I tried it again later, and I lost money. And then you give up. Yeah, I was right eventually, but I was right too early. And if you're putting money on the line, it hurts. So you, you tend to, you know, you know, other people, that, they, they also know it's going to end sooner or later, but they, you know, they react differently. Now, eventually this leads to recession, so it's unimportant. The boom is the basis of the bust. That is the bubble and the artificial high growth is the basis of the bust itself. Now this is completely different from the way that mainstream economists look at it. Mainstream economists are, you know, they're sitting there going, oh man, this boom is great, you know, party, tequila. You know, they say, what, what's bad with it? More jobs, people are making more money, houses are worth more, assets are selling for higher. What could be wrong with that? Austrian economists, we're that boring old guy in the corner going, you're going to hate it tomorrow. You know, most of us don't listen, you know, too much tequila. And we are right, tomorrow it sucks. You know, you got to hang over. So economists, Austrian economists, saying the boom is what causes the hangover. They're connected, you can't separate them. So you should be unhappy when you see these booms. But of course, politicians love it. Oh, we created this boom. You should vote for happy. us. Huh? I don't feel happy. Yeah. Yeah. So people, and, and, and we can see this, you know, voters tend to be somewhat short-sighted. So they reward politicians. Uh, now, now the, what happens is that to understand this explanation, the Austrians use an understanding of the nature of capital and the production structure. Now it's based upon planning across time and how we make investment decisions under uncertainty. Now, the mainstream economists have models that incorporate perfect knowledge, meaning that you know what the future will hold, or you can predict it with reasonable accuracy so you can um, move ahead. And the mainstream economists have a, a fixation on the idea of equilibrium. 
was the Austrian commons have a fixation on disequilibrium as a, the nature of the beast. So disequilibrium is something that we have to learn to live with. <clears throat> Rather than using equilibrium as a, a, a goal for policymakers to move the economy to. The whole idea that we have equilibrium gives it the opportunity for politicians, well, we can move it to equilibrium, because that's where we all want to be. But the Austrians say, no, you can't, can't force the equilibrium. Because once you, the moment you even get to an equilibrium, it, it's going to disintegrate. It's not, a, it's not a fixed point in time. Now, this boom phase uh, is caused by, according to Austrian economists, by central banks. So it's fundamentally a policy problem. If we want to avoid booms and busts, we've got to understand that they're caused by policy decisions. In particular, the fundamental cause. If you take this away, there would be no bubbles. I mean, you can find this through history. There, there's a, uh, a guy who wrote a book on bubbles that went back to the 16th century and, and 17th century, looked at all these bubbles in assets and properties, and behind all of them are monetary explanations. You know, whether central banks existed or not, there were monetary explanations. Now, so the central banks either create, well, they don't create credit. Commercial banks actually create credit. Uh, central banks facilitate the ability of the central, uh, commercial banks create credit. Or the central banks can pump money into the system. So it's either direct pumping of money into the system by the central bank, or the indirect cheapening or lowering the price of credit through the interest rates. Whatever happens, or however it happens, either through credit or money, you have excess liquidity. What that means is that all of a sudden there's more pieces of paper floating around. And those pieces of paper, people tend to want to spend. When you get extra money in your pocket, you say, you know, some of it you're going to spend. Or if you save it, it goes back to the banking system and it's lent to somebody else. <coughs> now, banks stand because the central bank <coughs> is giving them access to lower interest rates. They can offer you a lower interest rate. So what do you do? First of all, you say, well, I wanted to save, but now the interest rate's lower. Will you save more or less at lower interest rates? You save less, right? And you say, well, interest rates are lower. I can borrow more to consume. So, at the same time, investors, especially those who invest in long-term capital projects, they say, wow, this is a long-term capital project. If I get a low interest rate today, this allows me to produce more for the future earn higher profits because, you know, when I am selling this in the future, it would be more expensive for me to borrow. So this is a great opportunity to borrow today low interest rates. So firms invest more, individuals save less. This creates an imbalance in the economy. Decrease in savings, which means fewer funds being made available <coughs> and more consumption, but you've got more borrowing. And, but how is that being financed? You know, normally, saving has to occur for investment to occur. So if the only way to increase investment is increase saving. Right? But here, what you've got, you've got decreased saving, but increased investment. Now, how did that happen? Money. Green pieces of paper. Nothing. It's just pieces of paper. That's unsustainable. That's a bubble. That's the beginning of a bubble. That's air that eventually gets pumped into the economy. Because normally, the only way you can invest more is to save more. But we've got this people moving in different directions. Households want to save less but consume more. Investors want to invest more. And they can because there's more pieces of paper available. More zeros at the end. So these are un- secured credits because savings secure credits for investment, right? But here, things, later, all you can go back to is pieces of paper. 
These are inventions. This is creating something out of nothing. This is the counterfeiting that uh, Sema was talking about yesterday. I think Joseph was talking about that. Now let's look at this boom and bust cycle. Uh, the bust phase. We talked about the boom. Monetary pumping. Artificially low credit. Cheap credit. Now, the credit induced boom and they, based on artificially low interest rates. Now, she is a very intelligent business person. Her business model, her business plan earns 7%. More or less on average every year. Now, I'm not so clever. <coughs> you know, I, my business model will yield 3%. Interest rates are presently 5%. I can't, I can't more. Right? All of a sudden, the central bank says, ah, we're going to lower interest rates from 1% so banks can lend at 2%. Hello! I can now invest. Right? I go to the bank, borrow the money for 2%. And then I buy all the resources I need. But what happens to her? She was planning to expand, and she goes into the market, and they say, Well, this idiot just bought the stuff. He said, but, but she wants some. Well, you can have it, but you have to pay a higher price. Right? The cost of inputs for her will go up because I got access to this artificially cheap credit that creates a problem for her. She now has to pay more for, which means her profits will be lower than they would have been. Her rate of return falls. So, this, these pieces of paper have created problems for productive value. In other words, everybody in the room values what she does at 7%, which means they value her more than me at 3%, whatever I say. Yeah, 3%. So I'm less valuable to you collectively. But all of a sudden, the banks, the central bank, they, they may they look to be more valuable. It didn't change reality. She's still a better business person. But I got, <laughs> I got the things first because I got jumped into the market and bought up all these resources. She comes in later. And now, so what happens then, we, 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 we begin to see that Inputs are redistributed. You know, they go to people with bad business models, weak business models. Uh, now, and the reason we think that we, normally in a market economy, the only way that interest rates will fall is if people save more. If people save more, interest rates fall, right? Just like supply. If there's an increase in supply, prices fall. So the increased savings, interest rates fall, right? So normally when you see interest rates fall, you say, ah, <coughs> the reason interest rates are lower is that people want to consume less today because the only way you can save more is to consume less, right? By saving more, you consume less. Huh? But, but, but we're assuming, or earn more, but we're assuming that nothing has changed. We're just yeah. set as parents, but things remain the same. Now, when interest rates normally fall, investors say, ah, because people don't want to consume more today, they want to consume more in the future. So it will benefit me to borrow today to fulfill that future consumption when people get around to wanting to buy more. But that's not what happens. Interest rates fell, not because people want to consume uh, less. It's because the central bank simply pumped in liquidity. In fact, what people want to do is consume more today because they find that savings pays them less, less so they consume more. So we've got producers moving in a different direction. Producers are trying to produce more for future consumption. And consumers are trying to consume more at the present. This creates an impossible imbalance. It creates disharmony in the production structure. Now, so, now, the interesting thing, as I mentioned before, normally bulls and bears balance each other out. 
But artificially low interest rates. Now think about it. The interest rate is probably the single most important price in an economy. And it's the price that's the easiest to know. You know, you and I don't know the price of property in Timisoara, maybe. We don't know the, the price of, uh, of, of locally grown apples somewhere in the north or what. But most of us will be, it's really easy to know what the interest rate is, right? Now what happens is, if interest rates are artificially low, and what we mean by artificially low is if the central <laughs> bank was not pumping money in, they would go up. So the central bank, through monetary policy, is putting them low. So, everybody who has access to this information, which is virtually everyone, is reacting to it. Now, they are making decisions that are what we call clusters of errors. So this explains what looks to be herd behavior, what Keynes called animal spirits, remember that? No, this cluster of errors is created by this misinformation being put into the system by artificial low interest rates. Without that misinformation, there wouldn't be this herd behavior. There wouldn't be a cluster of errors. So what happens is that artificially low interest rates make most people optimists. Asset values are going up. Bar more today. But it is misinformation. It's based upon an unsustainable, artificially low interest rate. Now, why do interest rates eventually have to go up? Oh, inflation in other words. Real resources are scarce, and as people begin to bid for them, prices go up. And as prices eventually reach a certain level, the central bank will reverse its policy to try to eliminate consumer price inflation. Okay, that's the normal sequence of it. So what happens to me now? I borrowed the money from him at 2%. Now the interest rate goes back up to 5%. What happens to my business model? Kaput. I'm earning 3%. Right. And it's your fault because you didn't value me. No, it's my fault. And it's the central bank's fault. I made an error. So what has to happen is that I now have to liquidate my investment. So he's a good businessman. I said, okay, I paid 100,000 euro for this, this factory. Uh, how much will you give me? He's 30,000. Huh? 30,000? Today, tomorrow, 25. Huh? See, he understands values. And I said, yeah, I paid 100,000. He said, yeah, but it doesn't produce anything that people value. Complain to them. Okay, pay me higher prices. Well, I won't pay you higher prices. Why do you pay me higher? Because you want to buy something else. So I have to sell it to him at a loss. Is that good or bad? It's good for the economy because as long as I had them, I was destroying wealth. By taking them from me and using them to sell things that you value more, He's doing a favor to the community, making the economy better off. Can you name that the toxic asset? I'm sorry? Can you name that a toxic asset? Yeah, so you're buying, yeah, you're buying, I mean, toxic asset has become the expression for that. Uh, it's really an asset of unknown value. Uh, but this is what we would call more precisely excess capacity. I, I was using resources to produce things that, that, that weren't valued sufficiently by the community to cover the cost of capital. And you're presumably buying them at a lower price in order to, to activate them. So the aftermath of the bust is good. You know, it's, in a way, it's like if you were an alcoholic or a drug addict. When you're trying to detoxify, it feels terrible, right? It's just like the bus. It feels terrible. But why do you do it? Because after that, you recover, you're healthy, you live a longer life. It's the same in the economy. The reason you want to, this is like a detoxification of an alcoholic or drug addict. The, the, the bus is squeezing out the toxic assets, 
the toxins in the body so that the economy, the body will be healthier and will survive. So, so it, you know, it's kind of eliminating, huh? it's kind of eliminating the imaginary debts. Exactly. Well, they're not imaginary, they're real debt. But the debts that have been they're imaginary, created. imaginary values, imaginary real debts. Also, yeah. And those, the, the real debt, because somebody has to repay them. Right? So I have to repay them. I owe the bank 100000 And he's giving me 30 if I don't give it. Today I get 25 tomorrow. You know? I still owe the bank the difference. Unless I bankrupt. Now, so, uh, now falling prices are, they have to happen. This was the right thing. I said, okay, well, no, nah, I'm going to wait. Okay, thank you, but I'll wait until I get 90 because I can, I can suffer 10,000 loss. Well, that means that these assets are not being used. I keep waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden, the central bank said, we'll help you out again. I didn't solve the problem. He would have solved the problem if I sold it to him and got those assets activated again. Yeah, but in a money. valuable form. With money already collected from us. And well, so yeah, well, maybe, maybe. Only if the central bank gets back involved. And this is what's happened at the present time. The central banks are trying to hold up the value of these assets. Not for us. So they don't collect. Now, this is what they've been trying to do in the United States. The housing prices were way over value. They were up here. And now they've fallen here. And the central bank keeps trying to keep them from falling, but what have they been doing? They keep falling slower. I mean, they, they collapse. And then they, they try to hold them up. But these housing prices are still coming down in the United States. Because the, the overshoot was so dramatic. Because there was so much excess liquidity. And so much of <coughs> the overvalued assets against real debts. Okay. Uh, again, central bankers use the, the image of the Great Depression, the deflation of the Great Depression, as a way of scaring policymakers who may have not understand economics, and to scare the public into believing that it's better for you if we pump in more money again. And again, the 10-year-old said, say, okay, the problem is caused by pumping too much air in. And said, okay, now we're going to solve the problem by pumping more air in. The 10-year-old was saying, huh? The rhyming part of the battery. Oh, far. Oh. What happened? Thank you. I didn't plug it in. <laughs> I'm so eager to, to talk to you. Okay, now. Now, in order to understand the, this overall argument, and, and this is where the 95% of the economists, they don't, they don't understand this. They've never studied it. They don't, they don't interpret the <coughs> economic process from this perspective. And this is why they get it wrong. So, and, and I used to be among those economists. I used to teach the same mainstream economics that you find in all the books. I did it for years. And again, I did it partly because I was lazy, maybe, in the sense that I didn't look for other explanations. And also, I said, why should I just throw that explanation? Everybody agrees with me. You know? There's a certain comfort in it. So, now, to understand this whole process, you have to understand how interest rates impact on investment behavior. And that is based upon this relationship that we call the time structure of capital. Now, <clears throat> What we're going to look at is that there are two ways for interest rates to fall. Now, interest rates can fall if there's more savings, right? Increased savings, lower interest rates. Now, that's the normal market-driven uh, economic response. Increased savings by household means there'll be more money available. Interest rates will tend to fall. Now, there's another way for interest rates to fall. Never mind what happens to savings if central banks push them down. Whoops. Wow. So there's a disconnection with economic fundamentals. Here, this is perfectly in synchronization. 
Less savings, higher interest rates. Less, more savings, lower interest rates. Here, it's the central bank doing what they want to do. What's they got to do with economic fundamentals? Nothing. It's not driven by it. It's a policymaker deciding, you know, on sort of like central plan. He's a central plan. He's saying, how much, how much money should there be in the system? We'll do that to in introduce uh, change in interest rate. Now, so let's see what happens if interest rates fall naturally because of higher savings. Now, to understand this, we have to understand why people change their saving behavior. Now, the Austrian economists talk about time preference. Now, this is a, a preference to consume over a period of time or invest. Okay? So, you have two basic decisions. Consume today, consume tomorrow. So your time preference tells, do you tend to want to consume more today, or do you prefer to consume more tomorrow? Now, let's try to understand this in our own, say, for example, our life cycle. When you're young, you get your first job, you look at your paycheck, you spend everything. You consume everything today. You never had so much money before. Okay, so you're going along, and then you get married. And you think, well, I now I have to look after somebody else and share things with them. Uh, maybe I don't consume everything anyway. She won't let me go out as much at night, so I can't spend it on the bars and all. So <coughs> I'll save some, and then you have kids. And then you say, well, I've got to pay for their education. So I, your time preference changes, right, over your life cycle. When you're young, you want to, you tend to consume more. And the only way to get you to save more is if the interest rate went up. So for you to get, if for you to save more, interest rates would have to be relatively high. Whereas as you're older, <coughs> when you have other responsibilities, you might accept a lower interest rate because you want to save more. So you'll save more even in a lower interest rate. So this is what we call time preference generally. Your preference to consume across time, today versus tomorrow. Now, let's see what happens. Now, when you begin to save more, that is an indication that you want to consume less today and consume more tomorrow. Right? Because you, you've only got two possibilities from your income, from your fixed income. If you increase savings, you decrease consumption. You decrease savings, you increase consumption. Okay? It's just a mathematical equality. Now, so, what this means is that you're putting aside money to say to consume more in the future. Now, at the same time, as the interest rates fall, producers say, aha, interest rates are lower. That means I can borrow at these low interest rates in order to satisfy the future demand for consumption that you have now that you've decided to save more. So I have to be prepared as an investor. So I borrow these low interest rates today to invest in a, and it takes many years to produce the factory, and once you produce the factory, it takes many complex stages to produce the final good. So um, we've got really good harmony here. Consumers want to consume more in the future, and producers want to produce more for the future, right? So the economy is in harmony. The interests of the, of the, uh, the concerns or the preferences of the consumer and household are in uh, agreement with what the producers are doing. Consumers want to consume more in the future. Producers want to produce more in the future. Okay? That makes sense? Now, let's look at what happens when the central banks get involved. Now, the central banks, <coughs> there's no more savings, right? The same amount of savings initially. They push down interest rates. Now, how do consumers and producers, investors react? Well, all of a sudden, when households see lower interest rates, how do they react to saving? Well, they save less. Because the rewards for saving less. Well, if they're saving less, they're consuming more. 
So they want to consume more today because the rewards for saving have been reduced. So even if you're an older, married, family, right, with kids, lower interest rates mean that you're going to get less, so why would you save as much? You'll tend to save less. And eventually to get some loans. Yeah. <coughs> and not only will you save less because interest rates are lower, you'll borrow more to consume more. Because it's an opportunity. Say, so, you know, we you know we saved for a lot of years and now all of a sudden things that we couldn't afford because the interest rate was higher, we can now afford them. But it looks like it. So all of a sudden, consumers are trying to consume more today, but what's happening to the investors? They say, oh, interest rates are low. I can borrow capital to invest in future consumption. So consumers are consuming more today, and producers are producing less for consumption today, and more for consumption in the future. So instead of the consumer and the producer having the same sort of forward-looking vision, we've now got this imbalance. And how is it paid for? Five years when you get rid of the products, you don't have buyers. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. When when you you invest all this money and capital and so on to produce these goods, that maybe in five years' time, when the factory comes online, there are not as many buyers. It's happened now. Yeah, it happens all the time. And this is what this is what uh, Austrian economists call mal investments, bad investments. What I call unsound investments. So what happens is this: you've got this imbalance, and it's creep imbalance, and the economy created by central bank policy. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's unsustainable. So this process occurs where profits get squeezed. You begin to uh, eventually. <coughs> And, and then, if consumer prices rise high enough, then the central bank will eventually raise interest rates and the party's over. Because then things... And it has to occur. It's the only way to solve the problem. So let's look at the realities of the current recession. Now, this is the interesting problem. That 95% of economists, the mainstream, did not see it coming. They didn't predict it. I know of only one economist who not only I said it was coming, but I only know one economist that said <coughs> exactly when it would occur and it did occur in 2008. And that was Professor Fred Volver, who's here. And he published the paper in 1990 something seven. And he predicted 2008 would be the end of a housing bubble. And he got no credit for that because he's not part of that 95%. He's like me. He's an outsider that people say, well, you know, he does it, uh, you know, what does he know? Well, what does he know? He, he knows a lot. He predicted exactly what it was. Now, did they go and ask Professor Fulbury for a solution? No, they went to ask these guys. The ones that didn't know it was coming. In, in the United States, Alan Greenspan said, oh, there's no property bubble in America. There's some overheating in this market and that market. There's no bubble. This is crazy. Now, so the same people that didn't see it coming, which means if you didn't see it coming, you didn't understand the problem. But they're asking them to solve the problem they didn't understand. Now, explain that to that same 10-year-old. Now, okay. Would you think that if we have a problem and the people that didn't see it as a problem should be the ones who fix it? Ten year olds say, no! No! You're scaring me! I'm ten years old. Stop scaring me with all this stupidity. But if you're an intelligent PhD economist with a Nobel Prize and you say this is bull, this is nonsense, <laughs> people think you're intelligent. You get and you're scared into the 10 year old wet his pants. Don't let me live in a world of this kind of insanity. But we do. So, so what happened? These guys ignored all these.
Abraham's asset in the Bible. We didn't do it. Now the reason, the, the problem is that macroeconomists, which include what you may know as Keynesians and monitors, monitors are the opposite side of the same coin. They're not protectors of the free market by any means. They only understand if you inflate the money supply, somehow my arm is inflating the money supply, they only care about one thing. What happens to the price level? <coughs> if there's no increase in the price level, there's no problem. Monetary policy is good. And so what they do is they show you and say, look, look, here's the consumer price index, which by the way I help calculate, and I define it as I like. Don't worry about that. But it's, it's low. So I'm doing what I should be doing. And so 95% of the economists are going, yeah, this is the right thing. There's no consumer price. <coughs> I have a question. Those guys don't understand that in their logic, the price is just a convention? Yeah. No. No. They, they don't understand anything because they, <coughs> as I see it, they, what they understand is Keynesian economics, which is something built not on sand but on air. There's nothing beneath it. They, they, they look at national income data as though it has a reality to it. Which are these these it's a convention. Imagine. Yeah. So it's just now, now the other thing, good economists like me <laughs> understand that an inflated money supply, yeah, okay, it can affect the price levels. But it can also affect commodity prices, asset prices, exchange rates, eventually interest rates, lots of things. So I worry about all those things. And I see them as a result of monetary policy. But these guys don't. They can't solve the problem because they don't understand the problem. The, I mean, imagine this. PhD economists working for the, the central banks sit around and make up excuses for why they didn't cause these problems. I read this, I mean, I, it, it's my laugh of the day. I mean, I had a good time laughing last night, but I never laugh so much <coughs> as when I read the reports from the uh, District Bank of, of San Francisco, the Federal Reserve System, and they say, sure, uh, energy prices are going, but we didn't do it. You know, they'll recognize that there's a problem, but they'll then explain exactly with great details why they didn't cause it. I mean, it's just completely crazy. So they don't take any kind of blame for these problems. Animal spirits, failure of capitalism, anything but us, the central bank or government policy didn't do it. So okay, again, these aren't these aren't economic explanations, these are just stories. Right? Animal spirits isn't an economic explanation of very anything. Huh? <coughs> stories, very things. <laughs> I've got stronger words for it. <laughs> now, so as I said, no consumer price inflation, no problem. Monetary policy, keep going with it. They believe that booms are good. As I said, these are the crack addicts. These are the people that, you know, sniffing cocaine addict or drinking tequila. They, and everything they tell policymakers to do is exactly wrong. I mean, it, it, it's really disturbing for me when people, my friends, ask me, what do you think? You know, Everybody around the world, what do you think about President Obama? So I'd like to go drinking with him. He'd have been fun at the table last night. We would have been sitting and have a beer, smoke cigarettes. You know, it'd be probably a laugh a minute. But when it comes to economic policy, he's, you know, he's more destructive than Attila the Hun. <laughs> Genghis Khan, these guys were these guys were nobodies. The wealth is being destroyed by the economic and monetary policy in the United States government and its handmade U.S. Central Bank. Destroying wealth around the world. And I'm beginning to feel guilty about this as an American. I'm really I'm now believing, beginning to believe that America is the enemy. But if, uh, Americans are, because they're a little bit uninformed. But American policies are just, in the, 50 years ago, we were helping the world. We were making capital available, <coughs> encouraging people to do good things with their institutional arrangements, and now we're... <laughs> it's 
I, I, I'm, I'm really embarrassed. You can't defend for from yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm innocent, but I'm still embarrassed because of my country and the association. And what we've done to the dollar. Either way, it wasn't our dollar, it was the world's dollar. We were the custodians of it. And we used to. And we, we were totally responsible. We weren't totally irresponsible. Now we're totally irresponsible. Because the government, the only way for our government to solve their debt problem is to make the dollar worth less. This is the long, longest story in the history of governments. You debase the currency to devalue your debt. This is, and I'm, I, I'm so embarrassed as an American. <coughs> and I'm really, I, and I'm angry at these bastards for it. I mean, I, because the pain is calling everybody. So, no, I don't like Obama. I, I, I probably would like him as a man, but as a policy chooser. And, no. Now, Austrians saw this bust and saw it was inevitable. And Professor Fulvery said, when? Precisely it would occur. He didn't give the money. But the year was pretty good, predicting it in 1997. So what we see is that asset and commodity bubbles, which were the beginning of the recession, were caused by loose monetary policy. In other words, this is the fundamental cause. You take it away, it wouldn't have happened. If there had not been excess liquidity, if there had not been artificially cheap credit, it would never have happened. It wouldn't have happened. Can you set the interest rates in order to match the preferences of people? If you were named governor and they told you <coughs> you can have this job but you can't destroy the central bank system because you would want as an Austrian, uh -huh. uh, you just have to make sure it works. How no, well, do you set the interest rates? The only, the, what you do is you follow the market rather than lead the market. So what central bankers tend to do is lead the market. That is direct the market where they want it to go. So, Are you really connected to the market? Can you get... Well, you, in, the sense that, in the sense that you can alter interest rates you want. I mean, you impact the market indirectly through interest rate policy. So what you have to do is follow the market. That is, if, if you know, you let the market make movements in, so the people say, more interest rates go down. You say, okay, that's nothing to do with me. Now, the only thing central bankers should do is make certain that banks have sufficient liquidity. So, if, you know, you oversee the banking system and you only lend to a bank if it has good collateral. It's got to have sufficient collateral. If it doesn't, you don't, then, then sorry, you have to close. So that's what a central banker should do. They follow the market. They react to... Uh, but there won't be as many problems if the central bankers are creating them. So what you would find after a short period of time, you probably you could close the central bank. Unless you want to prosecute war. And that's what central banks originally existed for. The Bank of England was all about allowing the monarchy to finance <coughs> wars and colonialism. And it, until, you know, I mean, it, it, that should be a beginning point to to, to study central banks. So why were they formed? I mean, if they were formed for evil purposes, to start with, at least it would, you know, you would begin with a certain sort of skepticism about central banks. But we don't do that with our students. We say central banks are there to help the banking system, they help us out, it's all about stabilizing what they're always portrayed in a in a very positive light. I think if we re examine and if we got our professors to teach, Bank of England was the first bank, an absolute, well not an absolute monarchy, a monarchy, an imperialistic monarchy, created in order to finance wars of aggression and imperialism. Then we would change our attitudes about it. Let's go. Yeah. Okay, very quickly. Okay. Uh, an expression here. More government borrowing. It's just like explaining the 10 year old. If governments borrow more to correct consumers borrowing too much, 
If central banks lower interest rates after keeping them too low, <coughs> this is what we call in English hair of the dog. So if you've been bitten by a dog, the way you solve it is to take some of the hair of the dog. And we use this when you, if you drink too much, you have a hangover, the next day you, you drink more to get over the hangover. This is a hair of the dog that bit you. What bit you was the alcohol. Well, anyway, sorry. Complex expression. So in other words, you, you can't get over a hangover by drinking more alcohol because you're going to have a hangover the next day instead of today. And maybe it'll be a worse hangover. And this is exactly what all of these policies are doing. They're extending the recession. Normally, in America, recessions end within about uh, <coughs> at most 18 months, normally within nine months. And when they do, there's a very rapid recovery. We've been in recession since 2008. And no end in sight. Why don't they understand that they're doing the wrong thing? The 10-year-old child. You say, normally it would be nine months and, and go to recovery, and now we've got three years and no recovery. The child says, I think you're doing something wrong. I don't know economics. You must be doing something wrong. Because normally it does this. Ten-year-old children can understand these things. We're being victimized by stupidity. Now, the, the, the basic argument here is that capitalism didn't fail. This isn't a failure. This is a failure that was caused by avoidable government policy. And it's being promoted by continuing stupidity. I have, I'm sorry, I just have to call it that. And what does what do you do propose? Because well, the solution is we don't have interest. Interest rates have to go up. Governments have to stop spending. Businesses have to go bankrupt. I have to go bankrupt. My business is no good. I have to sell to him at the lowest, at the best price I can get. The, the, what happens is that politics is also about avoiding short-term pain and pushing it off to the future. So this is what they're trying to do. But if a government who has a country in crisis and propose to hire you one, well, they would never hire you. But, yeah. ah, so if you are ready to tell them. No, but the thing is, what, you have to choose between what we could call a short, sharp shock. Something, you take the pain now. It'll be hard, but it won't last very long. Okay. But the politicians want to take, they want to put it out in the future. So the pain doesn't go away, <coughs> but it goes off into the future. So it's a little less painful. But what they've done now, what I fear is that we could be on the, the, the edge of another Great Depression. Because if the American economy collapses, everybody else goes with it. Because, for example, in Romania, they cut the salaries to 35%. Yeah. They cut the pension well, to 50%, but they still get money from the uh, FMA, from the International IMF. Yeah. Uh, yeah. IMF. IMF. So, in two years, we're supposed they to have to get better, but with this money from them, they will cut again the salaries. Yeah. Well, well the, the problem is, in many of those cases, their salary commitments were made without any fundamental behind them. The salary commitments were based upon debt. Right. They, they, they tried to make it too quick. Again, this is, this is democratic politics. Democracy creates incentives for politicians to do the wrong thing. And this is what we're living with today. Democracy is the god that has failed us. It's, you know, it's really what <coughs> justifies all of these debt problems in Greece or in the other country. Portugal, Spain. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so I didn't mean to keep you so long, but thank you. Thank you.